Uh, my name is Danny Tibbs. I am the director, uh, writer, and producer of The Lure. My name is Noah Copeland, and I'm a producer for The Lure. I also did some camera work and did the sound and score. My name is Miranda Fritz, and I was producer, director of photography, and pretty much did whatever else needed to be done. The original concept and the reason why I made this movie was for my family. My dad, Jim, and my uncle, Nathan, and my aunt, Betty. Their mom and dad was my grandpa, Koi, and grandma, Terrico. And so I wanted to give them something um, that they could look at and kind of reminisce about images of him in that silver boat with the cowboy hat on and the, the open button shirt and camel cigarettes and little things like that to kind of have a movie with the spirit of my grandpa Koi and my grandma Terrico. Well, first of all, I started writing this story when I was fishing with my dad around 2009. Uh, we started kind of talking about how my grandpa Koi would fish out in the same lakes that we were fishing and started to think about uh, my grandpa and the things that he experienced in life and trying to put that in the movie so it's not necessarily a biography of him but a more of an homage to him. Koi meets a blonde girl that kind of uh, takes his breath away but then he meets a sweet brunette girl. That was the original story. And my grandma was actually full Japanese and my dad kept saying, I don't understand why he can't meet a Japanese girl in the movie. And I kept saying, well, it's set in Oklahoma in the 40s. Went ahead and just said, I'm gonna put a Japanese girl in this role. And it kind of changed it and actually made it better because it meant more for her why no one was asking her to dance because she was different. Especially you have to imagine how hard it would have been to have been a racial minority in Oklahoma in the 40s. And to be at something as awkward as a high school dance. I was given some letters uh, from my grandpa Koi and he talked about how he didn't fit in or he was good-looking or anything like that And so I added that to the story. So this whole kind of transition from the early idea to where it's at now has just been a, a lucky uh, Break been making films with these guys for uh, a couple of years now. I started as a uh, video production student and after I finished the program I got to have some actual hands-on experience uh, making films and have been doing it ever since. I was a former student and the Option D group decided for some reason that I needed to be initiated into the group, so. I think my favorite part of the entire process was when we shot at the gym because there were so many people there. You know, most of the time when we're making films, we're scrounging around, you know, trying to get who we can to show up and do this or that. And it was just like a surreal moment to say, this is actually happening, all this long wait, and seeing the stage actually kind of start resembling what I thought in my mind a long time ago. And it was just like something sentimental for me. My favorite part was whenever we did the gym shoot. That was just really cool because we had all these different people and it just ended up working out so well. Uh, we had you know, the 50 extras or however many there. And on top of that, lots of crew. There were just, it felt so busy and so alive. So it was a good experience just to have so many different uh, little niches and roles all working together as a whole. I think that it ran pretty well. Like everything that we did was pretty smooth and everything, but it was difficult to find locations I remember going around Lawton trying to find the outside of the school. There was several weekends where uh, me and Devin, I think one time, drove all over uh, Oklahoma. And my mom was like, where are we going? And I was like, we're trying to, I'm trying to do something. Just let me do my thing. I think the most challenging part of the film was the temperature in the gym. Even though it was my favorite part uh, as a whole, it was hot in there. You can't have the fans going on all the time because you're trying to shoot and you don't want the sound, you know, especially as a sound engineer, I'm like, turn off all the fans. But as soon as it takes over, everyone, we all crank up the fans, wipe the sweat off, get our composure back together before we can do the next shoot because it was hot. 
Grace Fellowship, who uh, the church owns an old elementary school, and uh, they have a gym in there. Uh, so we were lucky enough to find that place. Inside of Koi's mom and dad's house uh, was a lucky find. I was at Trail Dance Film Festival, and they had their uh, pre-party at the Stevens County Museum. As I was walking around there, they had a little inlet of one of the uh, settings of how uh, people lived throughout the decades. And there was one, I was like, this kind of looks like the inside of what Koi's parents would look like. And um, Kova, the owner there, was uh, obliging to let us shoot inside and use the outside to kind of use as the exterior of the uh, auditorium and it just, it worked out just perfectly where we could shoot both of them there. But that was the most difficult part was finding locations. Of course, the first one that we made sure that we got was uh, Wichita Mountains Wildlife Refuge, um, mainly because that is where uh, my grandpa would fish out of those lakes out there. So uh, I was able to uh, get a permit to go shoot uh, this uh, little scene out there and. We were able to do that. We ended up shooting out there twice at Quanta Parker Lake. The, the first time that we did it, it was in May, so it was like warm and it was like actually kind of hot. So we had walkie talkies and we couldn't really tell what each other was saying and we kind of split up and there was like, they were doing this and we were doing this and then the walkie talkies died and that was kind of difficult. But then we went back in February and it was cold and so we had to act like it was summer and I felt really bad because I kept having to take Bill Brewer's jacket from him and he was all cold. And It was funny how it was summer and then we had to make it look like it was summer in February. And this really allowed us to take our time and get it the way we wanted and I think in the end that made a uh, better experience for us and made a better movie. What's awesome about this movie um, is all the people that I got to work with. Uh, Cassie and Erica with the wardrobe and hair. Without them, there was no way I can get 40 extras to look like they're from the 40s. Working with them and, and rely on, on them and their talent made this whole movie process just go so much smoother and made our movie look so much better. What raised the level of the quality of this movie was the actors that we had uh, playing the roles. It's one of those things where um, we had a lot of interest and a lot of really talented people from Oklahoma come out and be a part of it. Pretty obvious from the very first, I think he was the second audition was Matt uh, playing young Koi. And he came in and he was basically young Koi in the audition, exactly what we wanted, you know, uncomfortable and nervous. And I don't know how much of it was him being uncomfortable and nervous with the audition, but he played that part really well. The older Koi role was uh, Bill Brewer, and I, was ha I happened to meet him uh, at, a, at a talent show. Of course, he's a, a phenomenal actor from Oklahoma. He kind of had that look from my grandpa Koi, and especially when we put the hat and the, and the wardrobe on, he really looked like old pictures of my grandpa. Probably the best story about an actor coming on set in my whole time making films was when Erica came on set uh, when she was playing Terrico. Now, we had everybody there um, with their scenes and, and dancing and stuff, and she came in a little bit later, and it was like like Cinderella walking into the ball, and everyone kind of gasped. She looked so beautiful, and she fit that role for Terrico. I think everybody on the whole set just kind of like looked at her like she was this mega superstar. And uh, it, it just, it was really fun to see that. We were lucky enough to get Arden to play Deborah, the blonde. She did an amazing job having to play that role of seductress, but at the same time, be someone that you didn't really like near the end because of their attitude was a little selfish. And so she did a good job playing that role as a foil to Koi. We also had Julia who played Mrs. Capsule. Uh, the stern chaperone. I believe this is her first film, which is pretty stunning because she played the part just perfect and gave just a great performance. And we also had Aaron who played Mr. Stanley, the other chaperone. In his audition, he just blew us away with the way he portrayed Mr. Stanley. It just made that role stand out even more. 
uh, and Jill Sanchez and Michael Gibbons playing the mom and dad. It was just kind of a, a godsend that they, they happened to be there for us. We were lucky to get Michael because certain days we had open, he couldn't make it, but then it would snow and we had to push it back and it would snow and push it back and then eventually we got right into the window where we had him and Jill there at the same time and uh, it just made, again, made our movie even better. It's hard to get extras to come out to play something that they may not be in for no money and stand, sit around all day and we were lucky enough to have all these people show up to sit in a hot gym, wear the makeup and the hair and the, uh, the wardrobe and be able to have fun with it all day long and even though they may not be in it as long as they would like or even me like, uh, they can at least look at it know it was a fun experience and they were contributed something that uh, made the movie so much better. Part I'm most proud of is I think the score's uh, ending song. It was more orchestral. I never really tried to do something as grandiose as that where I had several string sections going on at one time. So I actually tried to attempt it the way you would with an orchestra and arrange it like that which I hadn't had any experience doing before but I was really happy with the way it turned out. I really liked my band stands that I did. They're, they're glittery and they took a really long time and they were really nice. So I really liked them. What makes me most proud about this is that I had a lot of former students uh, and current students at the set and they were running cameras, they were doing sound, they were doing lighting. And I was able to just kind of step back and just direct, and they were uh, able to get all that stuff accomplished, and I was able to rely on them. It made me proud that my students was actually making me look good. It's kind of a thing that I'm always the most proud of whenever I make a film, is that whatever thing it was that we did this time that we didn't do last time, the thing that we did that pushed ourselves forward, because every time we do something, we want to get better and we want to make it better than it was last time. I think that this is our best film so far and I feel like every time we do one we get better and better and that all hinges on um, us working together. I just hope people really realize all the work that went into making this film. It was over a long process of time and we all came together and worked together and it was just I hope people realize that it was a lot of work. I get to work with uh, former students of mine, and that's Noah Copeland and Miranda Fritz and Devin Jacoby and um, all the other people that have come out of my class that has continued their passion in making movies and I, was, I am able to work with. Um, all this stuff wouldn't happen if it was just me trying to do it. It, it definitely takes a team effort, and uh, Option D is a team effort. and. Uh, it's, this movie is something that I will always look back on with fond memories, um, just knowing that it was something, a, a long journey that had a uh, great reward at the end of it. And um, hopefully um, we can continue on making more movies.